Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So one of the most common things I hear in the comments section for my videos, besides shedding questions, of course, are questions about neurosteroids. Every video, I always at least get asked a couple of questions that say something along the lines of, But Kevin, finasteride screws up your neurosteroids. It can give you brain fog and make you depressed. Aren't you worried that finasteride is going to affect your brain, bro? Well, first of all, what does finasteride have to do with neurosteroids? Steroids. And what are neurosteroids exactly? Well, steroids in general are substances in the body that are synthesized from cholesterol. And these steroids include the male sex hormones such as testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, also known as DHT, as well as female sex hormones like estradiol. But the brain also synthesizes steroids, and some of these steroids have the effect of modulating the activity of neurons, which are brain cells. Some of these neurosteroids include allopregnanolone, androstanediol, allotectin, tetrahydroxycorticosterone, also known as THDOC, and also dehydroepiandosterone sulfate, which is also known as DHEAS, as well as several others. These various neurosteroids interact with a specific receptor in the neurons of the brain called the GABA receptor. Changes in neurosteroid levels can have an effect on your mood, and synthetic neurosteroids are currently being developed in order to treat conditions such as depression as well as epilepsy. So what does this all have to do with finasteride, you may wonder? Well, Finasteride, as many of you guys know, is a blocker of the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. This blocks the conversion of testosterone into DHT, and DHT is the trash hormone responsible for hair loss in people who have the genetics for androgenic alopecia. The 5 air enzyme, though, is also involved in the synthesis of neurosteroids. This figure here shows that the 5-AR enzyme not only converts testosterone into DHT, but it also converts progesterone into dihydroprogesterone and converts deoxycorticosterone, or DOC, into dehydrodoc. The next step involves the broccoli enzyme, also known as the 3A-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which is a bidirectional enzyme, unlike 5-AR, which only works in one direction. Anyways, it is the 3-alpha-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzyme that actually creates the neurosteroids, allopregnanolone, THDOC, and androstanediol. And if you want to know why I call it the broccoli enzyme, I'll go ahead and link a video below because there's a lot of drama behind that story, let me tell you. But anyways, this fear about finasteride and neurosteroids, it is based on the biochemistry of the 5-AR enzyme that is blocked by finasteride. Like I said, and as you can see in this diagram here, the 5-AR enzyme is not only responsible for converting testosterone into DHT, but it is also a step in the creation of numerous neurosteroids. So the effect of finasteride on neurosteroids has been proposed to cause several side effects effects like depression and brain fog. Now, it is worth mentioning that depression was not one of the side effects identified in the original trials for finasteride. However, rare cases were found in post-marketing surveys, and the FDA added it as a possible side effect in 2011, and I have a video about finasteride and depression that I'll link below. But it's important to realize that this change in the label by the FDA was caused by an explosion of unverified anecdotal reports of depression, as well as brain fog with finasteride usage, as well as numerous lawsuits against Merck, who were the original creators of finasteride. Much of this activity was due to the get-rich-quick nature of American jurisprudence, as well as the power of the nocebo effect, about which I made a video, which I'll link below if you want to learn more about that. Anyways, this update to the label is what has caused finasteride-hating doctors like Dr. Trash to frequently bring up the subject of neurosteroids and his many diatribes against finasteride. He bases this fear-mongering on articles like this from Godar that was published in 2019 entitled, quote, The steroid genesis inhibitor finasteride reduces the response to both stressful and rewarding stimuli, unquote. In this article, rats were given finasteride, and then the rat's behavior was assessed using a bunch of stressful tests. So, in these rats, some behavioral changes were seen after finasteride. As an example here, you see that finasteride decreased the behavior of rats sniffing the other rat's genitals, which is typical behavior from your average Propecia Help Forum member as well. So, also, the rats became more sluggish after finasteride was used, as seen here. Another test was done of these rats that sounds more like a form of torture than a test, which as a vegan really triggers me, but going into detail about it, what happened is that the rats were put into a water-filled chamber that is inescapable. At first, the rats are stressed out and try to escape, but eventually they give up and stop moving. Here's a short clip showing the mouse versions of the test, but trigger warning, it's pretty graphic. The mouse forced swim test is a common test used to predict antidepressant efficacy. In the forced swim test, 
mice are placed in a tank filled with water. The mouse remains in the tank for six minutes. The subject's behaviors are recorded during this time. Generally, in the mouse forced swim test, the last four minutes of the total six minute session is scored. The reason for this is the fact that most mice, regardless of treatment, are continuously mobile in the early stages of the test. This activity overshadows any potential treatment effects. Mice generally float in water readily. However, they still manifest small movements to balance their bodies and keep their heads above the water. These behaviors are not an attempt to escape and should not be scored as mobility. Also, after a single bout of mobility, mice, even though essentially immobile, still can drift in the water as a result of the momentum gained earlier. The sooner the rats give up, the more depressed the rats are, and this test is often used to assess the effectiveness of antidepressant drugs in rats as well. So, in this study, the time until the rats became immobile and gave up their struggles in the four swim tests became shorter after they used finasteride, meaning the rats acted more depressed on finasteride. So, what are we to make out of studies like this? Is this really evidence that finasteride affects neurosteroids and causes depression in humans? Well, as it turns out, no, absolutely not. These poor rats were tortured and murdered for no good reason at all, as it turns out. There are three reasons why we can't extrapolate from these rat studies to human studies. The first reason that I have pointed out before is that these rat studies invariably use much higher doses of finasteride than that are used in humans. Remember, the normal dose of finasteride for androgenic alopecia is one milligram per day. The doses of finasteride used in the study were 10 to 50 milligrams per kilogram. If the same dose was used in an average sized adult human of say, let's say 70 kilograms of body weight, you would be talking about doses of 700 to 3,500 milligrams. Not only that, in this study, the finasteride was not even given orally, it was directly injected into the mice. So presumably there was even more absorption into the system than with oral dosing, in which a significant significant proportion of finasteride is inactivated by the liver before it enters the bloodstream. So I understand why animal researchers use such mega doses of finasteride and other drugs to do their research. They're basically looking to see if these drugs have any effect at all. So why beat around the bush and use a small dose in their research? If you are looking for an effect, you are more likely, likely to find that effect if you use a huge dose of the drug. But this doesn't translate well into what effects these drugs would have in humans. Another example of this is the artificial sweetener known as Saccharin. In the 1970s, large doses of saccharin in rats were found to cause cancer, but these effects did not occur in human beings, and that's why the FDA was still able to approve this sweetener, which has proven to be safe in humans despite causing cancer in rats. Anyways, from a study like this rat study that we're talking about, which used a very large dose of finasteride in rats, we can say that maybe there is a possibility that there might theoretically be some effect in humans too, but this would have to be validated in humans using human-sized doses, which has never been done. And that's just the first problem with these animal studies done on the neurosteroid effects of finasteride. But there are two other major problems as well. The second problem is that finasteride doesn't have the same effect in rodents that it has in humans. In humans, finasteride predominantly blocks the type 2 isoenzyme of the 5AR enzyme. Finasteride has almost no effect on the type 1 isoenzyme in humans. However, in rodents, surprisingly enough, finasteride actually blocks the type 1 enzyme equally to the type 2 enzyme. This is discussed in this article, which deals with the interspecies differences in how finasteride works. The paper says, quote, in contrast to the selective inhibition of the type 2 isoenzyme by finasteride in humans, both isoenzymes of the 5A reductase enzyme in the rodents demonstrate comparable inhibition following finasteride exposure, unquote. In fact, this difference in the blocking characteristics of finasteride in rodents versus humans has been recognized by other investigators as well. In an article by Paba in 2011, the authors say, quote, the translational value of the preclinical investigations on finasteride's behavioral effects is partially limited by the fact in rats, finasteride has a high affinity for both 5AR1 and 5AR2. This characteristic is strikingly at variance with the relative selectivity of finasteride for 5AR2 in humans, suggesting possible differences in the neuropsychological outcomes of this drug." Unquote. In fact, as this paper points out, studies of men with benign prostatic hyperplasia 
actually showed improvement in mood on finasteride. The authors of the paper say, quote, several studies have even reported potential beneficial effects of finasteride on anxiety and mood in BPH patients, but this outcome is arguably influenced by their enhancement and quality of life due to the redu reduction of urinary symptoms, unquote. Now, I think one of the major causes of depression is obviously hair loss, and one of the best treatments for depression is regrowing your hair with finasteride. So I bet that if you were to look at everyone who takes finasteride for hair loss, you will see a hell of a lot less depression than people who don't treat their hair loss at all. Personally speaking, saving my hair did more to promote my personal well-being and self-image than any other positive lifestyle change I have ever made. So earlier, I made the point that the finasteride affects both the type 1 and type 2 isoenzyme in rats, unlike in humans where it just suppresses the type 2 isoenzyme. Well, why is that important? This gets to the third reason these rat studies don't apply to humans. That's because in the brains of both rats and humans, the predominant 5-air isoenzyme is the type 1 isoenzyme. There is much more type 1 5-air isoenzyme in the brain than there is type 2 5-air isoenzyme, which is the isoenzyme that finasteride affects in human beings. The authors of the same study say, quote, in the adult brain, 5-AR1 is the prevalent isoenzyme and is therefore conjectured to account for the largest part of the 5-A reduction reactions occurring within neurosteroidogenic pathways, unquote. So unlike in humans, in rats, high doses of finasteride strongly affect the 5-AR type 1 isoenzyme, thus affecting brain neurosteroids and rodents because the brain predominantly contains the type 1 5-AR isoenzyme. But you can see why these effects don't translate into human side effects. In fact, if anything, there's evidence that finasteride and dutasteride might have beneficial effects for certain neurological disorders, and we'll be covering that in our next video coming very soon, so stay tuned, and until then, keep fighting the good fight, my fellow hair loss witchers. I'll see you next time. See ya.